So let's start with the today EC online game change seminar series. We started already, uh, it's the fifth uh, seminar on our um, cosmology series out of 10. And uh, it's called the captivating cosmology from the Big Bang to tomorrow. And today we will listen to Herminia Calabrese, the latest from the CM CMB. So first of all, thank you so much, dear Herminia, that you accepted to give the talk in our uh, online series. And, um, and of course, we look very much forward to listen to you. Um, this series started now more than one year ago. And uh, based on his success, uh, we decided to continue and to start a new series. Again, this is now the fifth. And the series we, which where we started was, it's now on the cosmology. And uh, just to introduce you very briefly, uh, Ermina Elvina Carabese is a professor of astrophysics at the School of Physics and Astronomy of Cardiff University. She obtained several, well, she did her PhD in Rome, in Italy, the University of uh, La Sapienza. And then she moved with several um, fellow, very prestigious fellowships between Oxford in the UK and Princeton. And since May 2017, she moved to Cardiff University to join the Astronomy Instrumentation and Astronomy and Astrophysics Group, where she leads a cosmology team supported by the European Research Council starting grant. So uh, congratulations also on your grant. Emilia Calabrese works at the intersection of cosmological theory and data analysis of the cosmic microwave background signals and combine the CMB with galaxy surveys to obtain state-of-art constraints on cosmological scenarios, including limits on neutrino physics, dark energy, and inflation. And um, yeah, I think I will stop here. Of course, he's also very much involved in uh, telescopes and telescopes collaboration. But now back to your seminar. Of course, we are looking very much forward to hear the latest from the CMB. And uh, I have to say the screen is yours, myself. I will now mute myself and disappear with my screen. I just something for the audience. There are two possibilities to ask questions at the end of the seminar. So the seminar should last around 45 minutes and then you have the possibility to ask questions. E either you raise your hand and then you will be unmuted or you just write the questions to, to the chat uh, window. So Arminia, we are all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks everybody for joining uh, to listen to me today. It's a real pleasure to uh, be able to give this talk and in particular to uh, present uh, the CMB within this series of, uh, of talks. Um, so what I'll be doing today is um, I'll start by giving you a snapshot of what I'm actually talking about when um, uh, I refer to cosmic microwave background and its observations. Uh, what we have been doing over the last couple of decades and where we've got to, um, and then conclude with uh, prospects for the future, what's left to do and how we're gonna do it. So let's uh, get started. Oh, one second. Let's see, it's moved, yeah, okay. So as the name suggests, to get to the cosmic microwave background, we need to look at the sky in the microwave uh, regime of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and if we do this with a dedicated uh, telescope or experiment like the ESA Planck satellite, um, what you get is an image of the full sky that looks like this. Uh, and here you're seeing basically a superposition of different emissions coming uh, from all sorts of sources that have um, microwave emission uh, and that we collect uh, when we look at the sky. And then what we need to do is to uh, remove basically uh, everything that is not primordial from that uh, combined image uh, and reveal the underlying background. Uh, so this means starting by uh, removing compact sources, which uh, really are radio and dusty star forming galaxies that appear like a dot in the sky. 
and then remove the emission from our own galaxy, which will give us some diffuse radio and thermal dust emission. And once we've done this, we are left with this smooth uh, uniform uh, map of the sky with tiny fluctuations, as you'll see in a minute, that is really uh, what we are after uh, and what we want to uncover uh, for the cosmic microwave background. Um, now, what is this exactly? So when we collect that image of the sky, what we're really doing is to take a picture of the universe when it was only 380,000 years old. So here now you have an image of the full cosmic history, uh, and I have highlighted uh, here uh, where the CMB lies in that picture. So I was telling earlier that it's interesting that the CMB is halfway through this series of talks that you're listening to when I always refer to this. This is the very first light that we can observe in the universe. So for me, it's the kind of the starting point of any kind of cosmic history whenever I talk about that. Um, so what we're seeing here is uh, as I said, the first light ever emitted uh, is uh, a radiation uh, that at the time uh, of, uh, of at this particular time in cosmic time uh, was corresponding to a very dazzling black body with about 3000 Kelvin. And then as it travels across the universe, uh, it cools down and it reaches us today over here with, as a very faint uh, background uh, in the microwave regime with a mean temperature field of about 2.7 Kelvin. Now, if I stretch out this image and simplify it to remove um, uh, things and, and go through it in different steps, uh, we can follow uh, the critical points in cosmic time that are relevant for this radiation. So we start with the Big Bang, which is the, the time when this is generated together with everything else in the universe. And then we have this very quick expansion moment right after Big Bang caused by cosmic inflation, uh, which will stretch out uh, the perturbations in the early universe as well as uh, the properties of the CMB. Uh, the photons uh, that are um, carrying this cosmic microwave background will be coupled to all the other particles uh, that are present in the very initial hot and dense state of the universe. And then finally, when we reach this famous 380,000 years old, uh, what's happening is that the universe has cooled down enough for uh, neutral atoms to form. So the ionized particles that were coupling, um, that they were holding back basically the CMB photons are now forming neutral hydrogen and other uh, light elements. And, and so the CMB is now becoming to uh, freely propagate throughout uh, the universe. The photons travel through the dark ages when there is basically no other light but the CMB, and then they travel through the formation of the very first stars. And now these are very highly energetic. Um, there is very highly energetic emission coming out of these stars. And what happens is that the universe Reionizes, meaning that those neutral particles or those neutral atoms that had formed now break down again and trap the CMB photons again into interactions with different ionized particles. And then they continue through the forming and evolving large scale structure of the universe until reaching our telescopes today, uh, which we are. Um, uh, we have got there ready to capture uh, the, the radiation as it, it reaches us. So the key aspect of this light and the, uh, in, you know, the reason why we use it and we consider it really important to study the physics of the universe is because it's gone through all its stages and phases and it can inform us on everything that happened in it. So if we go back to the initial image, and again, we are here, we can use uh, the properties that we measure over here to infer everything that happened in the early universe, because any physics process happening over here would have left an imprint on the CMB. And then we can use 
uh, the, the properties that we measure of the CMB over here to, uh, to look at what happened as it traveled from uh, this moment onwards uh, to today. And then we can pinpoint some you know, specific properties of uh, the universe that we want to study or uh, that we want to uh, uh, discover or nail down and uh, look at them through the eyes of the CMB. So for example, if we want to learn about the nature and uh, evolution of the primordial fluctuations that were present in the early universe and that then generated the cosmic structures that we see later on, we can do that by looking uh, at uh, what the CMB is telling us about that. Uh, you have seen in a recent talk um, uh, how we can you know, constrain uh, relativistic species and light elements, uh, for example, during the Big Bang the synthesis phases of the universe, and they will have an imprint on the CMB as well. Uh, we can do physics of rayonization due to the coupling uh, of CMB photons with uh, ionized particles uh, at cosmic dawn. We can study dark matter properties because they will be involved in how the large scale structure of the universe interfere with the CMB photons. And similarly, galaxy evolution and finally dark energy at very late times. So there is a lot uh, that we can do and that um, we have been doing and we will be doing uh, over the next few years. Uh, well, what, what I've said so far is that we need to measure the properties uh, of this uh, radiation and, uh, and then use it to do physics. But what I mean by that is uh, really to collect all the possible information that we can extract on this electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and that means to go beyond just measuring the mean temperature field that I said corresponds to about three Kelvin when it reaches us, um, go beyond the standard, well, this is just uh, another component due to our um, uh, movement, it's a Doppler effect, and dig down into very tiny fluctuations that are present uh, in both the temperature and polarization fields of the order of 10 to 5, all the way down to 10 to 7, 10 to 8. Um, so the three main quantities that uh, appear uh, to be relevant to study in detail uh, the universe with the CMB are uh, tiny anisotropies, so fluctuations across different uh, areas of the sky when we look at the temperature of this radiation. And then equivalently, we have fluctuations in the polarization field of this radiation, and we combine these two to then extract uh, a weak lensing signal uh, for the CMB as well. So now in detail, uh, let me tell you why these three quantities are really important to measure and what they're telling us. So the temperature is the one we start with because as you see later, uh, and as I showed you early over here is, is the uh, highest signal uh, and therefore the easiest one to get to. Uh, but it's also the richest in terms of uh, uh, information because it immediately tells us about everything that happened in the early universe in terms of initially density perturbations, gravitational effects, and interactions with baryons um, uh, that the CMB has had. And then on top of that, there are some contribution from late times coming from interactions with galaxies and galaxy clusters. So by exploring and exploiting these kind of observations, we immediately get an answer on all these kind of physics. Polarization is generated by Thomson scattering of CMB photons off of free electrons. And so if you remember what I said earlier, uh, to have free electrons, we need to go back either at the beginning when these photons are first released in the universe or later on during reunization. So by picking up in detail the, the signal in polarization, we can really well characterize the physics at these two specific cosmic times. Finally, the weak lensing is a product of uh, the interaction of the CMB photons with the large scale structure of the universe. 
So as the photons travel, they get uh, bent and deflected uh, by everything that is forming and evolving in the universe. And this causes a net uh, effect uh, that is called weak lensing. And this is directly linked to the geometry and matter content and distribution of the universe all the way from the time of recombination to uh, today. Right, so this is the basic physics, this is the basic quantities we measure, but now how do we extract uh, actual um, uh, information from this? It's not easy from both a computational point of view, uh, as well as a, a more straightforward immediate uh, visualization purpose to do this with these maps. And so what we do is we compress the information that is present into these maps into angular power spectra. Um, and we do that for temperature, we do it for polarization, and we do it also for lensing, even though it's not shown on this plot. Uh, so what that means is that we take all the properties that are present in this map, and uh, we compute the variance in that map as function of angular separation in the sky. Um, and we get the so-called angular power spectrum. Um, for temperature, there is only one spectrum. The polarization is decomposed into two modes, uh, the E modes and the B modes that are linked to different physics. Um, and then once we have got the power spectra, we need to map physics and open questions about the universe that we want to find an answer uh, for into the different features and regions of this power spectra. So for example, uh, you immediately notice these oscillations that are present in temperature and E modes. And these are the acoustic oscillations due to the fact that CMB photons were coupled to baryons in the early universe. And so by studying the amplitude, the exact position, um, and the relative amplitude of these uh, um, oscillations, we can immediately uh, put constraints on how uh, much uh, of the universe density is composed of baryons or dark matter or other uh, quantities. Um, and so forth, um, you can do the same for all other uh, uh, physical um, uh, effects and components that uh, have affected the universe uh, history. On the right here, I have a list of open questions uh, that are um, being targeted by cosmology in the coming decade. Um, uh, and if you want, you can dig into them even more and write more detailed sub questions for all of these questions. And uh, and this is you know the um, task that we need to uh, achieve with uh, future uh, observations um, uh, in this power spectrum space by populating this power spectrum space even more than we have done so far. Um, so how do we do this? Um, how do we uh, collect observations to, to then extract the, the science? Well, you can have different uh, approaches depending on what you actually uh, want to do in terms of your scientific goal, but also, of course, what budget is available for you. And there have been three main uh, experimental campaigns that um, uh, have given us uh, uh, observations of the CMB. We have had uh, a number of satellites. Uh, we have had stratospheric balloons, and we have had also a rich uh, array of ground-based telescopes. Um, and how you choose uh, what you do depends a lot on uh, what you want to achieve in terms of uh, scientific goal. For example, if we uh, look at different experiments in a plane that collects some key observational quantities, for example, on the y-axis here, we have how much sky area we can observe. And on the x-axis, we have how much resolution in our data we can achieve. Then different experiments find a different location in this plane. Uh, 
For example, the advantage of having a satellite uh, is that you immediately get full sky access and you can see and you can get those maps that I've been showing you so far that were coming from the Planck satellite. But if you launch a satellite to space, you're uh, somewhat limited on the size of the telescopes that you can uh, put on your satellite. And that will limit the angular resolution that you can achieve. And this is important uh, because some physics, as I'll show you in a second, has got a lot of signature in the very small scales that are then not achievable by uh, uh, looking, uh, they are not reachable, sorry, by looking at satellite data. And so then other ground-based experiments uh, choose to sit somewhere else, either maximizing resolution with the penalty of having less sky, or if they're after a science goal, for example, like the bicep keck array uh, that only required looking at the very large scale, uh, they can position themselves uh, somewhere else. Um, so as I said, you choose to position yourself on this um, uh, parameter um, uh, space uh, depending on what you want to do. And in particular, if we try to link uh, your experiment or this uh, specific set of experiments to the scientific questions that we're after, uh, we need to keep in mind that we have scientific signatures uh, across the whole range of angular scales. Uh, and so the ideal uh, thing to do is to uh, collect uh, the full range of observations. And for that, uh, you can't do it with a single experiment. Uh, a satellite will allow you to reach the very large scales, but the limitation in angular resolution will cut you out then at some point over here. Uh, while well, if you have a ground-based experiment, you cannot uh, observe the full sky, uh, you have limitation on uh, how much sky access uh, you get, but uh, you can increase the angular resolution of your telescope quite significantly and push the range uh, in angular scale to uh, this end of the graph. Um, uh, sorry, I should have said, when you look at power spectrum space, um, uh, we usually talk uh, either about angular separation in the sky or uh, in terms of multiple moments, which is, uh, you can think of it as a 180 over the angular separation. And so when you have a very large angular sky separation, this corresponds to very low multiples. And then when you have uh, small angular scales, this corresponds to very high multiples. So, so uh, um, it's confusing, but they are the inverse of each other. So remember that. And now here I have a video that shows you how this works in practice. And you will see on the left hand side, uh, sorry, on the right hand side of the video data collected from the Planck satellite and then gradually adding to them on the left-hand side of the plot data from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, uh, which is a ground-based satellite that brings in additional resolution. And so what you see is that uh, with the satellite data, you have already captured the uh, large angular um, uh, distribution of your CMB temperature and isotropies. And then as you add additional resolution from the ground, you zoom in even more on the small scale physics that is present uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this signal. Um, and so uh, luckily we have access to both sets of data and we just need to work then in, uh, on putting them together and analyzing them together. So we do these, um, at map space, but we can do it also in power spectrum space. So then again, this is uh, a collection of observations from the Planck satellite to which we basically stitch then ground-based observations coming from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope here. Uh, and we get access to the full uh, set of the, the full range of multiples by putting the uh, complementary uh, data sets together. 
And this is an example of something similar than uh, for tensor uh, B modes of polarization. Now, there are two advantages in doing this. The first one, uh, as I said, is that you have physics signatures across a wide range of multiples and you wanna be able to recover uh, or discover all of them. Um, and then the other advantage is that this gives you a way uh, to increase your lever arm against contaminants. So a lot of those um, uh, uh, extragalactic uh, emissions in the microwave that I showed you at the beginning of my talk will significantly contaminate your data on this end of the power spectra. And so you need accurate measurement over here to be able to clean uh, uh, those uh, additional sources uh, from your data. Okay, so now I've shown you a few spectra. I've told you that we have had some uh, different uh, type of experiments going after the CNB, uh, but, but now let me bring you uh, quickly uh, up to speed with the state of the art of where we are. So we have had uh, almost more than two decades of increasingly accurate observations. Uh, I have chosen three random points on this timeline uh, to show you some results that uh, we have obtained in terms of observations. Uh, but there is there has been like a continuous uh, population of data that has appeared uh, over uh, the years. And then we uh, culminated basically into, in 2018 with the legacy release of the Planck satellite. Uh, and what you see is that, of course, the error bars and the quantity of data has improved significantly over the years. And we have also gone from adding to temperature, which, as I said, is the largest signal and therefore the easiest one to measure. Also, then additional observations in polarization. Um, this is the uh, correlation between temperature and E-modes of polarization spectrum, and this is the lensing, weak lensing measurement uh, over here. Uh, we also had an update of this in 2020 with new observations from um, ground-based experiments, in particular from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, and then from the South Pole Telescope in 2021, which is actually missing over here. But in general, these two plots, these two compilation plots are summarizing where we are in terms of observations of the CMB. And now we move to what we have learned from you know, running our analysis pipeline and um, comparing this observation with different theoretical models and extracting actual um, quantitative information about the physics of the universe. So, I summarize uh, the state of the art in cosmology coming from the CMB with three main bullet points over here on the right. The first one is that all these data are in agreement and have strongly established the standard cosmological model, which is lambda CDM, uh, meaning that our universe is well described by a specially flat six parameter model uh, where the content of the universe is dominated by a cosmological constant like dark energy component and called dark matter. Uh, and that the initial perturbations are well described by adiabatic uh, scalar perturbations following a power law spectrum. Um, on top of constraining lambda CDM, um, we have also tested a wide range of beyond lambda CDM model or uh, extension um, uh, to this model that allow us to put constraints on uh, other physics uh, of the universe. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this in a second. And then finally, we found that the model that we extract, uh, the model of the universe that we extract from this data is in good agreement with other observations, for example, from Big Bang nucleosynthesis or baryonic acoustic oscillation. But we have some issues, which I'll uh, cover in a second, uh, when we compare the CMB with, for example, 
uh, local measurements of the upper constant. Okay, so let's start with the first bullet point. Uh, so the uh, plot on the left here is showing, is, well, this is one example of a Planck temperature spectrum uh, as it's been measured. So the, the dots are the actual measurements and blue are the best fit, well, the predictions of the best fit theory model. And what you see is that you basically cannot distinguish data model anymore. We have reached a stage where the observations are so accurate that plots that just compare data and theory predictions are not really useful. And we need to dig down into the actual residual differences uh, between the observations and the model to be able to you know, study in detail from a statistical point of view. Um, uh, the uh, the agreement or or you know to extract the best fit uh, of the model. Uh, so for lambda CDM in particular, we have uh, just six parameters that are summarized over here or like uh, explained over here in terms of uh, content uh, of the universe as well as uh, properties of the initial perturbations uh, and, and then these parameters that describes the thickness of the universe at reunization. And by putting together data from temperature and polarization and lensing, we obtain sub-percent level on all of these parameters. So they are extremely well measured. Um, so this is uh, true for lambda CDM. And then, as I said, we go to uh, extended versions of this model and we open up more than just the standard six lambda CDM parameters to explore additional properties of the universe. For example, we can look at how many effective relativistic species were uh, in the universe. We can look at uh, the abundance of primordial helium. We can look at neutrino masses, we can look at curvature, we can look at deviations from power laws um, uh, and scale dependence of initial perturbations. Um, and these uh, validate uh, the um, uh, choice of lambda CDM as best fit uh, for our uh, for our data if you know we find no deviation from the standard model predictions for this value but then at the same time by simply putting a constraint on each of these parameters we have constrained additional properties uh, of the universe now as i said uh this picture works really well for the CMB uh, and for all probes within the CMB. It works also really well with some other observations, but there are two, uh, well, let's say one red flag and one yellow flag that we need to consider and be aware of. Uh, so the most important one, the red flag, is that over the last few years, there has been uh, evidence that uh, we have a statistical significant tension in the measurement of the Hubble constant when uh, we obtain it from the lambda CDF derived parameter that we get from the CMB or from direct measurements um, coming from late time probes, for example, from Cephades and supernovae. Uh, this plot on the right is showing a compilation of all the different estimates of this parameter. Uh, on the upper end of the plot, you have all the indirect estimates with H0 with the latest CMB results up here. And then on the bottom part, you have all the direct measurements um, with the surface estimates over here. And now if we take, let's say, this bullet point as reference, and so this orange line band, sorry, over here, and the latest Planck results as reference, so this purple band over here, they are in tension at the level of five sigma. Uh, and of course, I mean, like other uh, estimates, depending on also how um, uh, precise they are, uh, meaning that some of them have got larger error bars, et cetera, this tension will vary. Uh, but overall, you see that, you know, the orange and the purple band are quite distinct. 
Uh, there have been some, some attempts in, you know, looking at different systematic effects that could be either, you know, in the direct or indirect uh, estimates of these parameters. And, and if you change some assumptions, the values will shift a bit, but not enough to reach a consensus. Then the other thing that has been pointed out uh, in a number of um, papers in the literature is that if you go uh, to a more extended model, so say maybe lambda CDM is not the real description of the universe, maybe lambda CDM is the issue here. Uh, so if I look at a different um, uh, cosmological model, I will get a different measurement of H0. Uh, which is true to a degree, but what has come out uh, from those analyses is that the reason why you become more consistent is mostly because your data are not um, uh, measuring those other models as precisely as they are uh, doing for lambda CDM. So in practice, you are broadening your error bar significantly. And so the uh, better agreement is, is also mostly due to the fact that you have larger error bars. The other uh, issue, which is though at, at present just a yellow flag, uh, is uh, a less significant but persistent offset in the measurement of the strand of matter clustering. Again, as you obtain it from the CMB on the top or as you obtain it from a bunch of observations from uh, the large scale structure of the universe, being that weak lensing or galaxy clustering or cluster counts, for example. Uh, so now here you see that uh, the disagreement is uh, less significant than for the Hubble constant. So this is reaches two to three sigma when comparing with the, the estimates from the CMB. And sorry, the parameter we are looking at here is S8, which is a combination of the matter clustering on eight H inverse megaparsec combined with the uh, matter density of the universe. Now, the story here is slightly different from H0, also in terms of uh, looking at where um, on, of, on how to move these values, because uh, there are a bunch of known systematics, um, for example, on the late time universe probes, such as uh, galaxy bias modeling or intrinsic alignments or photometric redshift uncertainties, et cetera, that do shift your uh, results uh, and can shift them quite significantly. Uh, so there is an impact there and we need to do a lot of work uh, on, well, there is a lot of work being done uh, on, on those uh, uh, observations to be able to get to robust uh, modeling of systematic effects. And then the other thing to note is that uh, extended models or like significantly different models from Lambda CDM don't really change that much the results that we have uh, from the early universe. But what plays a role uh, in this estimate is the correlation of this parameter with other parameters, any other parameter that um, affects the growth of structure in the universe for example, neutrino mass. Uh, so if you change your assumptions on neutrinos, then you will have a different estimate of sigma eight. And that's just an intrinsic correlation in the model that we need to break down with better uh, observations in the future. Okay, and, and so far I've talked about cosmology, but I show you uh, in, at the very beginning of my talk that we also get uh, really nice maps of galactic emission from, you saw from Planck then, or any other uh, uh, source of emission that uh, permeates the sky in the microwaves. And this is an example of how you do the same uh, from ground-based observations, again, from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope um, here. So there is a lot more than just uh, temperature, polarization, and lensing power spectra that we turn into cosmology. There is also a lot of other uh, probes that we can then use for both cosmology and astrophysics. Now, 
Why are we still doing CMB? Well, because apart from having all those questions that we haven't answered yet, there is also a lot more that can be done uh, in terms of observations. Uh, if we look again at this plot that is setting our state of the art in cosmology, we can note that observations in this region of the spectrum in temperature are really the only ones that have reached the cosmic variance limit, meaning we cannot do better than that. This region in temperature over here and all the polarization and the lensing measurements can significantly improve and will significantly improve in the future. So we have drafted a list of questions that we want to extract from future CMD polarization. And we know that uh, the data uh, and the probe itself has the sensitivity uh, to be able to answer. Uh, some of these questions in detail. And so this is a list of things that future experiments will be looking at, in particular, trying to pin down the origin of the universe and the composition of dark matter and dark energy, as well as reionization. Keep an eye and open mind on the validity of lambda CDM, like if the issues persist, uh, then we might have to seriously consider that this is not the right model of the universe. And then, as I said, there will be even more astrophysics to be done uh, with uh, uh, detailed polarization observations. How are we doing this? Well, there is a lot uh, going on um, uh, in terms of experiments. This is a timeline that has ground-based uh, observatories and experiments on the top. And at the bottom, there are balloons and uh, forecasted satellites uh, that uh, will be happening over the next decades. I note that the dates and the arrows uh, here have been uh, shifted around to include some post-pandemic readjustment. Uh, some of them have been totally guessed by me, so please don't hold me accountable for where exactly these arrows uh, start and end. Uh, but uh, the point I want to make is that the field is continuing and there is a lot going on and there will be a lot um, coming out of these uh, in the next um, uh, decade. Um, I will go very quickly to just cover two of these um, uh, coming uh, uh, experiments because those are the ones I'm mostly involved in. Um, but uh, there will be similar results coming from uh, other observatories uh, and uh, we will really see a, a, a very dense and intense uh, decade. So uh, the Simons Observatory and the Lightbird um, uh, Telescope will take new positions uh, in this uh, uh, plot that I showed you earlier. Lightbird is targeting the very large scales. And again, it's a satellite, so we'll go full sky. While ESO, as I'll show you, has two sets of telescopes, a large aperture telescope similar to the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, uh, targeting uh, small-scale physics again, and a set of three small aperture telescopes that um, are after larger modes. Um, so LIBERT uh, briefly is uh, a satellite that contains uh, three different telescopes, uh, uh, the low frequency, mid frequency, and high frequency telescopes observing in 15 frequency bands in the microwaves. Uh, which uh, is forecasted to be launched around 2029. Uh, it's led by JAXA, so the Japanese Space Agency, and the plan is to observe uh, for three years once it's re it reaches its position. Um, the goal of LIBIRD is to uh, rule in or out um, uh, models of cosmic inflation and target the very first detection of primordial gravitational waves that are predicted by inflation. Uh, so we know already from uh, current data that um, uh, cosmic inflation is a good candidate to explain how the universe got uh, to its state. 
but those are all sorts of indirect evidences of inflation. For example, we know that the primordial perturbations are Gaussian, adiabatic, and nearly scale invariant, and there is a low contribution of tensor mode. But we have not detected yet the primordial background of gravitational waves predicted by inflation. So we quantify this with this R parameter here, that is a tensor to scalar ratio parameter, and we plot it uh, in function of the um, uh, behavior, the scale dependence of the scalar perturbations. In gray, you have the current constraints. So we have an upper limit on R uh, set mostly by bicep Keck and Planck data. And then in red and green, you have um, projections for what Leibert wants to do. So going uh, to much tighter upper limit over here, uh, in case of a real R being vanishingly small or zero, we will rule out a large uh, portion of inflation models. If instead R is non-zero, and let's say is similar to what the Starobisk inflation model predicts, then there is discovery space uh, at the level of about 10 sigma. So this is gonna be something uh, to watch out. And then finally, uh, so as I said, is in Simon's Observatory is a combination of two sets of telescope, 3.5 meter telescopes, and one six meter telescopes. The collaboration started with a donation from the Simons and Async Simons Foundation in 2016, and is now uh, busy building and deploying the telescopes with observations due to start, um, well, let's say uh, in the coming year, basically. Uh, what we are doing with SO, where we have two sets of telescopes because we want to do well, a wide range of science, and they require two different surveys and two different kind of telescopes. The SATs will go after the primordial gravitational waves, just like Clybert, but from the ground. And this, the LAT, the large aperture uh, survey, will instead map up to 70% of the sky at very high resolution to do everything else. Uh, that is not primordial gravitational waves. So, so all the other uh, cosmological uh, questions that I showed you earlier. And I'll skip these last two slides um, that show the reach of SO. I'll just highlight, uh, oh, sorry, of the SO large aperture telescope. And I'll just highlight that there is full overlap with a number of large scale structure surveys planned as well for the next decade. Uh, and this will have a lot of um, uh, give a lot of opportunities for combined studies between CMB and LSS. Um, I'll skip this as well, showing that there are also more opportunities in galactic science and transient science from SO. And I will go to my summary to conclude that. Uh, I just want to emphasize that, again, we've done a lot over the last couple of decades, but uh, there is a lot more that we can extract with uh, from the CMB. We are designing, building, and deploying the experiments to collect the data. We are preparing methods to analyze the data, and we watch out the theory landscape to make sure that we are uh, ready to test all cosmological models. And, and I just want to highlight that CMB polarization is going to be a game changer for CMB cosmology over the next decade. So it's fully appropriate for this series. But I also highlighted that I've been saying this in other talks. And so it's not just uh, for this series that I, I call it a game changer. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yev. Yeah, excellent talk especially also for me that I am teaching at the moment cosmology, but it's <laughs> nice to see what is the future of CMB. So questions, uh, please, you have two possibilities in asking questions. The audience, one, you can raise your hand and ask directly the question, or you can write your question in the chat and then um, we will read your question and uh, Elmina will answer the question. So we have already uh, one question from uh, Norma. Please, Mark, can you unmute her? Can you hear us? Hello, can you hear uh, me? Yeah. 
Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, um, I have three uh, quick uh, questions. Uh, first, I'm on the list of uh, general questions you um, presented for CMEB. Uh, you mentioned dark matter and the CME, or dark matter from the CMEB. My question is, uh, what uh, uh, what do you expect more uh, from uh, um, extract from the CMEB about dark matter? Uh, certainly not uh, neutrinos, I mean, usual neutrinos, perhaps, perhaps esteral neutrinos of the kilo electron volt. So, and, and why not mention CMEB distortions, a spectrum distortion for that? Uh, both of those are very good questions. So I'll, I'll take it in order. For the dark matter, what we can do and that's been done in the past, but there is a lot more promise in the future because there is a, a strong signature in both polarization and lensing, is to constrain uh, dark matter interactions with baryons. So we can put limits on the dark matter cross-section if there were to be an interaction with protons, for example. Uh, the other thing that we can do and are doing is looking at axion-like dark matter. So you can put limits on what fraction of dark matter could be made of axions if they were to be a component of it. Uh, and also what kind of mass range for axion particles you would need to be able to have a significant contribution as dark matter. Uh, CMB spectral distortion are also, uh, you're right, an important uh, uh, thing to keep in mind. It's not something I directly work on. It's definitely something uh, that uh, the community is preparing for in the future. There is no specific uh, experiment being um, laid out yet, although I know that there are a lot of people thinking about it and, and figuring out uh, how to go after them. So that's why they were missing from my list of experiments. But there was, you know, a, a general another CMB satellite in the next decade or next yes. decade plus that could yeah. be. Thank you. That. Uh, I, I don't want to, to start a discussion just to uh, say, oh. allow me to reply about, uh, um, about your mention of actions. I should say that many studies by now have uh, pointing that uh, action cannot be the total dark matter. That yeah. is, I mean, from galaxy, from galaxy, a particular phase space um, uh, density, uh, the data, the data of galaxy, and a strong observation. So this is, uh, I mean, to keep in mind. A second point uh, I think is important to keep in mind too, for experiments are theory too, is about uh, large angular scales and the low L, low multiples uh, part of the spectrum. And the set, third point that could be uh, also for that, for that range, it should be perhaps more explored. I, I know it's, it's not uh, very easy, but the correlation function to extract the information of the correlation function in real space, even for temperature. And that is an, an uh, interesting information to extract from CMEB. Thank you. Thank you. So we have one uh, more. So what do you say? What do you uh, say? I know that there have been some papers done for Planck. You can't do that on ground-based experiments because you don't really get very large scales. Um, and I think that the yeah there are some published work on that uh, extracting the real space correlation function for from the Planck data already. So we have one more raised hand from uh, Mark Sargent, please, Mark. Thanks for the talk, Armenia. Also from my side, um, was wondering if you could say in fact a bit more about the sub millimeter transients which you had on one of your final slides and couldn't really show us. I'd be interested to hear a yeah, bit more can, about that aspect. Yeah, I can go back to that. So this is something that uh, we are doing, um, you know, without having specialized on it because these transients just fall into our data. Uh, there is an example that I report here on um, 
uh, 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 strongly variable sources that we detected in the Atacama Cosmology Telescope maps and that we put out as a telegram to inform the community that this source has appeared in our map. Um, and as I say, because we have, uh, you know, a wide sky coverage, we can actually uh, uh, get into our days a significant fraction of variable sources. There are now a bunch of papers from both ACT and SPT that have detected uh, variable stars uh, and, uh, and they've also set limit on a bunch of other uh, kind of sources. Um, the idea for us is to develop uh, a pipeline that allow us to flag events uh, when we see them in the CMB for other experiments to then follow up in different wavelengths. Um, so uh, the goal is to have um, uh, trigger events basically on a daily sort of time scale. Uh, and then we are also now starting to expand uh, you know, our science team to, to you know, welcome people who are interested in looking at transient variable sources uh, and interpret them then from the CMB observations. So now we have a um, question in the chat from Javier or Xavier, excellent talk. <laughs> so, and um, then why are the error bars on the large scale CMB fluctuations frequencies uh, larger than those at shorter scales? Yeah, that's uh, because we only have one universe. Um, I'll, I'm trying to get to here. So, the error bars um, here are fully dictated by cosmic variance. The issue there is that you are at very large angular scales and therefore you have many fewer modes that you can uh, average on your statistical uncertainty compared to the small scales. So just naively thinking about these, you, you have a limited, a much smaller number of 90 degree separation in the sky compared to arc minute separation in the sky. And so uh, you, you are fully cosmic variance dominated. So thank you. I, perhaps I have uh, one small last question about the Hubble constant between direct and indirect. Yeah. Uh, this five sigma, which is, uh, well, surprising me. I'm happy they are closer to you know, so quite close, but um, this is only model bedingt. Uh, I mean, related only to the models for the indirect. So if you change your lambda CDM, you may bring them closer or how this so, will, how, what is your opinion? How this will uh, evolve in the future? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, a, well, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so in terms of models, what we have seen is that say you take, um, I don't know, an early dark energy model or a different, a completely different, you know, much more complicated than Lambda CDM model. Yes, they do get closer, but also the error bar on H naught will become so much bigger that, you know, by default, you are in better agreement. Um, so we don't know yet if changing model is actually solving the issue or just broadening your parameter space so much that you see it less, basically. So my approach to it is that we have got a bunch of experiments and observations coming in the next few years. I mean, it's enough to have new releases from both ACT and SPD next year to have a completely independent of Planck measurement of H0 or very close to independent of Planck. And at that point, you know, if you have three experiments telling you that that's the H naught value from the early universe, and at the same time on the indirect, sorry, on the direct, we have better constraints coming from the tip of the red giant branch, like these ones, if they also reduce their error bar, because at the moment they can go either way. You know, if they also then reduce the error bar and settle on the orange band, then there is a clear, you know, evidence that the early universe wants to go one way and the late time universe wants to go another way. And yes. then we need to worry about the physics. Okay. <laughs> so thank you once more for your excellent talk. Thank I you for like, having me. Thank you. And I would like already to announce the next talk. It's on October 13, the first steps 
of Galaxy Evolution with Katrina Caputi. And you can find, of course, the recording on the, on the EC webpage from all the from all our game changer seminar talks, but especially also from the talk from uh, from today from Armenia. So thank you once more and uh, have a nice day, evening or morning. <laughs> bye bye.